From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Republican State Representative Bobby Nardolillo wants to be your U.S. Senator, but he has to get through Sheldon Whitehouse and potentially retired State Justice Robert Flanders to do it. Nardolillo likely has decent name recognition thanks to his family's successful funeral home, but he's a relative newcomer to politics. The 37-year-old of Coventry just started his second term as State Representative. Now he's looking to shift from state to federal policy. Where does he stand on health care, immigration? And Donald Trump, our guest this week on Newsmakers, state representative and Republican candidate for U.S. Senate, Bobby Nardolillo. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program from WPRI.com, reporter Ted Nisi. Rep, welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. Thank you very much for having me. Let's ask you the big question first. Why do you want to be U.S. Senator? Um, I, I would probably say the, the same reason that I ran for state rep. Uh, it's my love for public service. Um, I feel like uh, the voices of Rhode Island are not being heard in the U.S. Senate seat. And I think uh, being a public official now and my love for public service and serving the community, um, we see if your voice isn't being heard, your concerns are not being met. So that that's my my ambition is to to fight and represent uh, the US Senate seat that isn't being represented at this time and when you say not being heard what are you thinking about uh, what's embedded in that i would i would i would say the communication i've had um since unofficially announcing in march that the needs per se and concerns uh are not being satisfied by uh, the junior senator we find that he has um a one issue agenda um, which is fine if if that's what Rhode Island expects out of the seat. Climate change, I assume you mean. Correct. I'm, I mean we're all environmentally conscious of what's going on, but we we're concerned with front burner issues on a national scale, and uh, we're seeing that the uh, junior senator is not like, fighting for but, those concerns. Ted asks, like what? What is what are the well, front burner would, issues that are not being met? The front burner issues, and from speaking with throughout the community is national security. Obviously, we've seen this since 9-11 that we're in a constant state of um, concern nationally. Um, uh, terrorism is is running rampant every time we put on the television. There's something um, of concern. We just saw that in England. Um, uh, those in the United States and America here, we're, we're concerned. We, we want to go to work and feel assured that we're being protected nationally. Um, with strong policy and and support from delegation here in Rhode Island. We want someone who, we're in a, real, a rebuilding process. Let's look at it this way. We're in a, under a new administration. The new administration stands firm on national security. We want uh, representation that supports that doesn't fight against it. We want someone who is going to not have a passive position on national security, but a strong, firm position. And the past administration shows that, you know, we, we're weak in that area. So uh, you're running for federal office. Let's uh, explore some of those federal uh, policies. Uh, if you were in the Senate now, would you vote for or against the GOP health care bill that was uh, passed by the House? I would have, uh, as it stands, of course, it's going to the, se the Senate, and once it goes there, it'll be probably reinvented. As we know, policy is created and then sent over and then reworked. I would have, I would have voted no at this time. Um, I had my concerns with um, the inclusiveness of those who needed care that might have been you know, disregard and under coverage. And it's not so much as health care. Everybody is saying health care. It's health coverage. It's, it's what are we looking at for uh, the cost of it. See, the health care aspect of it, 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 when folks think of health care, the physicians are providing all of this care. The care never goes away. It's the coverage, the, the cost of it. And that's what we're looking at. Uh, you know, the premiums are going to be higher. Well, we have to look at something that's inclusive, but also isn't detrimental in terms of funding. I mean, one of the proposals uh, Republicans are looking at as part of the reworking of the health care system uh, would uh, Rhode Island as part of the Obamacare and expanded Medicaid and the feds cover most of that money, about 90 percent of the cost. It would cut it down to about 50 percent. Uh, do you think that's the right approach or do you think that's a wrong approach? Um, but healthcare is multifaceted, as you said. When we're looking at all facets of what, what's being addressed, 
I would say at this time that we need to have consideration compassionately of who, um, not who, but what we're covering, the coverage of care and the cost of the coverage of care. So I, as we see it here in Rhode Island, there's a greater percentage, as you said, of folks that are being covered under um, kind of like a single payer, Medicare aspect of it looking. Um, we don't want to, and I represent Rhode Island, so on a national position, you know, what's working uh, here in Rhode Island might not be working nationally, but I think, not that I think, I know, I represent those here in Rhode Island, so their main concern in their health coverage is how I would vote and my concerns. So I would probably say that we need to, we need to look at it from a perspective of um, cost. So does that mean you, uh, you think it should stay, the Fed should keep covering 90% of Rhode Island's Medicaid for those people, or, or should it be brought down to, to spread it out more nationally? I think, it, I think addressing it to be spread out nationally is probably the way to do it. Um, my concern is, and the reason that I told you, obviously, when we're looking at the, the health care bill, it's, that's the outlook of it. But the coverage aspect of it and the reason I would have voted no is because of, you know, it's not inclusive of all of these folks that need this care. So we have are, to look- Are you a repeal and replace guy? I'm um, I am not a repeal and replace guy. Um, I would have probably, in, in Johnston, they had um, the congressional de delegation go in and they sat down to address the repeal and replace. I don't know if you remember that, that was in the senior center. I might have been one of the only Republicans there. And the reason that I was there is because it's important, me knowing that I was going to be running for U.S. Senate, to sit with the folks and, and to hear their concerns with if this is repealed and replaced, this is what's going to happen. And I sat there for an hour and a half and I heard stories and folks came up to me and thanked me for being there because I'm not making a decision under a party umbrella. I serve the people. I don't serve a party. So sitting there, I knew and I knew that I would have voted in a way that was opposite of, of my party because you're elected to serve the people. You're not elected to serve your party. So in terms of what we're talking about, about Fed coverage, on a national scale is how you vote, but you're being put in the position to vote for Rhode Islanders. So that policy is going to be revisited in the Senate, and I feel strongly when it comes back out, it'll, it'll address a lot of these concerns that will hopefully make me feel and Rhode Islanders feel uh, comfortable. Uh, when Donald Trump fired FBI Director James Comey, you tweeted, when your position warrants you to show strength and you choose to tiptoe, you're going to get fired. Hashtag FBI, hashtag Comey. <laughs> um, where did he tiptoe and uh, what, would, what, a, what would a show of strength have been? So uh, his prior investigations, we, we've seen that he could have been more firm in his position um, in regards to um, Anthony Weiner, let's say. The, the investigations through, th through that process. When you're looking at uh, the Hillary Cl uh, Clinton investigation, these are certain, uh, his position, top tier as the director, should have been looked at like he had nobody else around him and he was just looking at what needed to be done. And if, while I'm not the FBI director, I would have been a little bit more firm in my position um, and Position, what, I'm sorry, on Anthony Weiner? Is that what you said? Yes. I mean, Anthony Weiner, in terms of Hillary Clinton's indictment. Do you mean firm my position, like, like uh, indict her and uh, bring charges instead of not bringing charges? I would have said charges should have been brought. Um, even the Trump administration called for her to be addressed more firmly. And then they, they stepped away from that a little bit more. Um, I, would have, I would have said, just as we're looking at transparency, so transparency builds trust with government and those that we're supposed to serve. So when, we, when, you say in, when you say something, there's an expectation that you're going to do it. So when he sat there um, through these investigations, I just felt like there could have been more, I don't want to say strength because it's redundant to that, but I would say a, a firmer position, something of substance to come out where folks felt satisfied in the end. Well, some people might say that a show of strength is, um, you know, having an ongoing investigation into 
uh, Russia and possible collusion when you have the sitting president uh, uh, there. Do you not support uh, the investigation in, into Russia and possible collusion? I 100% um, support that. And the reason for it, not to repeat myself, but when you're, when there's a question, okay, anytime there's a question, um, that trust would be in question. I'm very big on transparency, so there shouldn't be any question when we're talking about something that you're thinking, sh did he say, or did this happen, or this and that, because what we're doing is we're stalling up government that serves the people by saying, should we do this, should we do that? If an, in an independent investigator is asked and warranted to a situation, to address a situation, Let's address the situation. Let's get the investigation done. Let's get it over and done with. That way the government can serve the people because right now it's not. What we're doing is we're addressing, we're talking about addressing a situation. And now the situation will be addressed and then we can move on to serve the people. But One final question on this because we have so many topics to get to on, yes. on Comey. You, your tweet appeared to show you supported the firing. Do you still think with what's come to like since that Trump made the right decision by firing Director Comey? I do support it. Um, I support it not internally knowing what the questions were asked by the Assistant Attorney General. Um, I believe he did his due diligence asking how the department felt about him being the head of it. But the President said he, he did it because of the Russia investigation. I don't support that aspect of what we're talking about. I, I tweeted out and addressed exactly specifically the fact that the Assistant Attorney General questioned the department and said, do you feel comfortable with him as your head anymore? And, and in the end, they didn't. So when you're losing that sense of security of your leadership. We, uh, we have just a couple of minutes left before we have to go to a commercial break, uh, Rep. So I want to, a lot of people don't know who you are, where you stand on some things. Do sure. you like to do this during debates? And sure. when somebody is uh, uh, announced they're gonna run for office, so I wanna do a rapid fire section uh, okay. with you. I'm looking mainly for yes or no answers. So you I got know, it. Uh, let's hopefully we can get through a few. The newer politicians usually are better at the yes or no. That's right. <laughs> uh, are you pro-choice or pro-life? Pro I'm pro-life. Uh, would you support legalization calling for term limits for members of Congress? Absolutely. How long? Um, I, first of all, as a state rep, I know you said yes or no. This isn't a yes and well, no. Well, I asked but you how long. So. Sure. I would say me being a state rep, I said I would serve three terms. U.S. Senate, the position that I'm running, two terms is satisfactory enough. To for, for, so for 12 years. Correct. Uh, do you support the legalization of the, uh, the recreational use of marijuana for those who are 21 years of age or older? I do not. Who did you vote for in the presidential primary? I voted for Trump. Do you support right-to-work legislation? I do not. Uh, would you support raising the age of eligibility for Social Security? I do. Um, it's, uh, Donald Trump, just sticking with Social Security, he wants to cut disability for Social Security. Are you, uh, are you okay with that? That's in the current budget that he just proposed. No. All right. Um, you recently gave, Ted covered your announcement uh, last week. You yes. You gave Donald Trump an A- minus at that time. Do you still stand by that grade? Um, I I stand with an A grade. Uh, the reason that I say A, A minus is because we're looking at a president who is not a politician. We're looking at a businessman who's addressing a broken economy. And at this point in time, at the 100 day point, we're looking at someone who's creating jobs, um, hundreds of thousands of jobs in certain industries. And that's the grade we're looking at now in terms of, you know, a political polish and uh, presentation. That's where he needs work. But we didn't, we didn't elect a politician. What we did was we elected a businessman to address economic problems. And as we look back, we with Mitt Romney, he was a businessman, broken economy. These are things that we have been in search of to fix our economy. And that gentleemen at the time wasn't the, wasn't the fit our current president is working on it and doing what he needs to do to fix the economy um, all right we're overdue for a break our guest is Bobby Bobby Nardalillo he is a state representative and Republican candidate for US Senate when we come back we're going to bring up the big topic of immigration stay with us you're watching newsmakers
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest is State Representative Bobby Nardalillo. He is also a Republican candidate for U.S. Senate. Uh, Rep, you've been outspoken about immigration. Some Trump supporters have expressed uh, disappointment that President Trump has been unable to follow through on his campaign promise to build a border wall with Mexico. Are you one of them? You disappointed in the president on this so far? Um, I actually didn't take a, a firm stance on the wall. I looked at it from we needed to uh, beef up security. I always felt as if if you're looking at a structure, you're going to find a way to climb over it, tunnel under it. But if you had more border uh, security patrol, I was that was my position, to secure the border with more Patrol. And his budget is calling for more uh, border security, right? Correct. Now. Funding and, for, I should uh, say. Correct. And I and I always felt strongly right out of the gate. There were some supporters that said, you know, we need a structure, we need a wall. But as we know, just from the drug cartels, there are tunnels mm -hmm. everywhere. So, uh, you know, to spend all of that money, which theoretically is our funding for it, um, I found it to be more um, wise to, to create positions of actual, you can see Border Patrol. Well, uh, It's more intimidating to see someone there as Border Patrol than looking at a structure. The, the Trump administration was just dealt uh, another loss by an appeals court in Virginia. Up, they upheld a, a lower court ruling that shot down the president's executive order on immigration. I want to know where you fall on this. Do you agree with the courts uh, when they say, quote, uh, this speaks with vague words of national security, but in context drips with religious intolerance, animus, and discrimination. Um, do you think the president is on firm ground, or is he taking it too far? Um, I would probably say that we need to address, uh, as I said before, you'll hear me say this very often, uh, a compassionate standpoint to positioning. Um, when it comes to illegal immigration, when it comes to the Syrian refugees or the whole refugee I call it a halt. It, it's been defined as a band. I think that any administration when they come in, uh, especially a new administration outlook at national security, immigration or anything, they need to take a halt. They need to revisit a position where they're seeing that there has been neg uh, negligence and security, maybe holes in certain aspects and that way they take themselves away, they've halted a position of whatever is happening. That way they can address the situation and then continue on. So I don't want to necessarily say he's gone too far because we've looked at eight years of one perspective and positioning on how to do things. Um, with a new administration, if it would be m my position, I would have taken a hold. I would have said, this is what we have. We have a new, a new administration, new positions to address certain situations, and then you find a way to address it as your administration. You don't want to continue policy that's broken, and we see it's that it is. Just to be clear, so a halt on, is that uh, for the countries in the travel ban, for all immigration period, for certain refugees? Who, who do you mean to Correct. halt? Correct. I think a halt in generalization is important on a, on a whole aspect of it. That's why I, I made sure to say in regards to the Syrian refugee ban, in regards to illegal immigration, we're looking at this in the words that I've said and the words and positions that the, uh, the president has taken. Senator Obama said the same words. He said the same words before he became president. He wanted stronger borders. He wanted E-Verify. He wanted the process of uh, immigration to be respected in our laws. So I'm saying the same thing that the senator said then before becoming president. Now, his position had changed, but that's a big change from a strong position as I have. And now the president is saying it, and it's being looked at as something that's totally outlandish. But it's been said. Um, on the uh, on illegal immigration, as Tim said, you've been you've spoken up about that at the state house in your current role. Um, if if you get to Congress, immigration is always a big hot topic. They've been talking about bills for years. What do you think should happen to those who are currently in the country illegally? Do you do you deport all of them? Do you uh, have an amnesty like there was in the '80s? What do you think should happen to the people who are here now who who are not who are undocumented? Uh, I thank you for bringing this up because illegal immigration has been talked about but nothing has been done okay so I've seen legislation on on a federal scale for reform okay but our delegation that's here fights for 
a, a reform, but doesn't really fight for it because we're looking at their position and we know it's been a situation and a problem. Folks are coming here, okay, for a better life. There's no question. The process is broken. The process needs to be fixed. But this goes back to several years of, uh, of legislation, okay? So if they're taking a position on something but not fighting for it, well, what, what change are you bringing to be, to be made? Now, the folks that are here, you're absolutely not going to send everybody back to where they came from. That's completely insensitive and totally uncompassionate to the situation. They're here for a reason. But the process is the process. So now we have to look at how do we fix this process. Now, several different opinions have come up where the folks that are here should be going through the process. They're here. Now you have to go through the process. You have to file to become a citizen. I'm fine with that, okay? I'm fine with that. The folks are here, they've established themselves, they have families here. You're not gonna separate families, okay? That's, that's not the way to do things. But, as I said, we have to take a halt on this because if the process is broken and you wanna fix it from internally now is what we have to look at, you have to do it this way and say, okay, we can't continue the, the route we're going. We have to fix it. So Now, the, Senator Whitehouse uh, often points to that he did vote for the Senate bill, the bipartisan immigration reform bill that passed back in 2013, which the House never voted on. Would you have voted for that bill? All right, so we're going to go back to the Senator's position. To vote on something doesn't necessarily mean you're fighting for it. It just means you're in the position to say yes or no. Now, if you know this is a situation, especially in our state, we're looking at an abundance of illegal immigration here within Rhode Island, and we have only a million people as a population, a very small state, and it's a, it's a, I always looked at it from a fiscal standpoint. It's very expensive. The cost of it is very expensive. If you know this and you have knowledge of this, and one city is, is addressed that their, their funding of question could possibly be in jeopardy. None of these things matter, but if you're representing on a national scale something that could be addressed and you don't do it, clicking green or red doesn't make a difference if you're not gonna position yourself, as I said. If, if we're looking at illegal immigration as an issue and your constant outlook is, is one thing, climate change, we'll change the clean, uh, climate change of illegal immigration here in Rhode Island. Take a position on something else that, that Rhode Islanders want you to. All right, let's get off immigration. Just a few minutes left. Look, uh, whether you like it or not, when you run for higher office, such as this one, uh, one of the impacts is the spotlight expands from just you, and it goes on to the rest of, of your family. And we saw Correct. that recently with the Go Local Providence report. Uh, Correct. Another family is accusing your daughter, daughter of bullying uh, their, their daughter in middle school. They say they had to take her out of school sometimes because of the emotional torment. Uh, I got to tell you, a lot of people uh, have heard about this and they want to hear from you uh, who has made anti-bullying a, a trademark Correct. of your political career. What do you say to all this? Sure, I'm glad you brought it up because this will be the first time that we publicly address it. And I'm going to be um, very upfront with you. As an, uh, as an elected official, um, I had to take a position on taking myself a, out of the situation and bringing it to the administration of the assistant principal. When I saw the accusations that not only my daughter, but it was a group of girls. So it's not just my daughter, it was a group of girls that was behaving a certain way. I reached out to the, uh, the vice principal and I said to her, um, I've talked to my daughter about this situation. She says that this isn't her, it's the other girls. Um, I need um, I need for you to see if this is the case because as a father to a father that's different you could say you know his daughter is saying one thing my daughter is saying one thing but I said if these things are happening in school I'm going to reach out to the school to ask them to to mediate the situation as a parent having not knowledge of what's going on in the school I've been in constant communication with the school department and they came up with on constant communication that the fact that my daughter has done nothing wrong. Um, she, she's guilty by association because the group of girls that she's with might be behaving badly. My daughter didn't do anything in an act to do this. Now, me not responding back to the parent, right. that, and I was specifically told by the school, by the vice principal, we'll handle the communication, 
That way it avoids apparent parent confrontation. I want to address the situation. And even when I reached out to the, um, the bully uh, awareness activist that I had been working with, I asked her, I said, you know, I put myself in a position where I took myself out so that the administration could mediate the situation and find out what's going on with the girls. And even the superintendent said, you know, there was an investigation done to see if there was anything with your daughter. Now, there was with another girl, which they addressed. But because I'm in the public eye, none of the other girls have been uh, talked about oh, but me. Seconds. But me and my daughter. And I'm, I'm fine with what happened with how the school addressed it. But there is no proof. And I asked, I said, did my daughter do something? I'll discipline her. But you have to show me is there proof. And they said, absolutely, we right. don't have any proof. We just want to show Bobby, the girls that this situation is a situation. Bobby Nardalillo, our guest on Newsmakers. We'll see you next week.